I'm sorry, I'm muted. That would be a problem. This is what happens when I'm working off of one screen. I'm so used to having multiple things that I can see. So I don't know that they heard you, Mr. Chairman. So third time's a charm. I like how everybody's just sitting there going, well, they're saying something. I don't know what it is, though. All right, so um, I'm Kevin Allen. I'm the Associate Director of the Weights and Measure Services Division. I'm going to call the role of our council members this morning, starting with our chairperson, Lynn Hamilton. All right, um, Michael Mathers. Okay, uh, Mark Ellery. Present via video. All right, and that means you can hear us too, which is awesome. Um, I couldn't hear Lynn. Oh, okay. That would be because my button wasn't pushed. Okay. Oh, see, good. It's, it's so technical these days, <laughs> you know? We can't just talk. You got buttons and different switches and things. Thanks, Mark. Um, Eric Edelin. Present. All right, and Leah Sigety. Present. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. All right, we'll go ahead and proceed. Um, first of all, we'll go through the approval of the meeting recording from March 1st. Do we have a motion to do that? All motion. Okay. And do we have a second? I'll second it. I will motion. Okay. Sounds, uh, we'll go ahead and just take a voice call, roll call of that. All in favor of approval of the recording as it sits, please say aye. 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 Okay. We, any nays? All right. We have approval of the meeting recording from our last meeting on March 1st. So now we'll just go ahead and turn it over to Kevin for the uh, updates. Okay, excellent. Um, switch out of here really quick. Okay, so our, our most significant update for the department recently is that we have a new director who was appointed and he actually started yesterday. I met him in person for the first time and he's been busy. Here's Mr. Mathers. Um, he's been busy learning everything about state government and agriculture, and um, you know, there's going to be a lot of learning for weights and measures. But his name is Paul Brierly, um, and he comes from University of Arizona Research uh, Facility down in Yuma, Arizona, and he has a pretty strong history in agriculture um, in Arizona as well as um, outside of our state. Uh, and so uh, we're very excited to have him on board. Um, I didn't want to invite him to the meeting today because it's only his second day. And, uh, uh, you know, he is very busy trying to get the hang of things. So I think at our next advisory council meeting that we have, um, I will invite him to come and just uh, introduce himself to the council. Um, but I met him in person yesterday uh, for a few minutes and um, really looking forward to uh, to providing an education about weights and measures. Um, he seems very easygoing. Um, looks like he'll be very easy to work with. And so uh, very excited to have him on board. Yes, uh, Mr. Ellery. Yeah, Kevin, can you spell his last name? I'm not, I don't know him. Yes, um, his last name is spelled B-R-I-E-R-L-E-Y. And if you type type in his name, you know, on an internet search, Paul Brierly, um, you'll find his profile there. Um, obviously, there's some press about him being appointed to the Department of Agriculture, but also his recent role with the University of Arizona. Um, but yeah, Paul Brierly is his name. So, um, so yes, he started yesterday, um, and he's going through, you know, the initial steps of learning everything. Um, our interim, our previous interim director, Jeff Grant, um, is the deputy director for Mr. Brierly. So that's great because Jeff has a lot of institutional knowledge um, for our department. You know, over the past eight years or so, um, he was the uh, deputy director for our previous director, Mark Killian. So we're glad to still have Jeff on board to kind of carry things through and keep that momentum for a lot of the projects that we're working on. Because sometimes you have a change in leadership and it can, it can really shake things up. But I don't think that's gonna be the case here. Um, 
So anyway, uh, we're all very happy to have a director because that was a big question. You know, everybody was a little anxious about who who's going to be the next person. Um, and so we're looking forward to working with Director Briarly. Um, and like I said, hopefully at our next advisory council meeting, which will be in September, um, we can have him uh, attend and, and give a little background on himself and, and introduce himself. So um, that's our biggest update for the department. Um, any additional questions before I move on to the division? All right. Um, so our division, we've been working to fill a couple of vacant positions. One, um, there we go. One uh, of our vacant positions is an investigator position. Um, we need another person up in Northern Arizona, so we've posted a position in Sholo. Um, what, did your battery go out? Yeah. See, it does happen. It happens, it happens yeah. Um, uh, so we have a vacant position up in Sholo because currently we only have one person in Northern Arizona. They're based out of the Ash Fork area. Uh, and Lynn, if you flip it over, there's a button on the button, power button. Just hold it down and you'll see the light come on. And then be sure to mute it right there. Yeah, there you go. All right, and so um, we've had the position open for a couple of weeks. We've actually gotten a decent amount of candidates this time around. Last time we had a position posted in Northern Arizona, it seemed like there was nobody out there. And so this time it's a little bit different. Um, so we're looking to fill that position soon. Um, we've been doing some interviews and hopefully even out the workload up there in Northern Arizona. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, this position being based in Sholo um, or nearby will cover basically everything east of Flagstaff, probably Payson, part of the Verde Valley, and then our investigator Dan, who's in Ash Fork, will cover kind of west of Flagstaff, uh, Mojave County, you know, Lake Havasu, Bullhead City, Kingman, that area. Um, so we're really looking forward to bringing another person on board there. Um, the, um, with, with the previous administration under Governor Ducey, there was a hiring freeze. And so we were limited at a number of people that we could have in the Department of Agriculture. And so that made it challenging if you had a vacancy because um, you were kind of competing with other divisions to fill it. And another division could possibly steal that empty position that you had. And so you had to try and fill things really fast. Well, that's not the case under the Hobbs administration. They've actually lifted that hiring freeze. And so we're able to um, uh, kind of seek adding some additional staff resource positions, which is great. Um, and so with that, the next thing that we're looking to do, and I'm actually working with our human resources representative to do this, is establish an in-house weights and measures licensing position. One of the things we've noticed over the past year or so is that We've received a lot of feedback from our customers that the, the time frame, the response from our licensing staff hasn't, hasn't been superb and we want to improve that. And because weights and measures is such a, a, a technical division um, when it comes to devices and the requirements and the time frames, uh, and we have a high volume of you know, correspondence that we receive, applications, uh, placed in service reports and so on, um, you know, I, I talked with our agency leadership and uh, we felt that the best solution would be to bring somebody back into our division to manage the bulk of our licensing tasks. And so they would be that point person to communicate directly with our customers, um, to process any applications, to provide assistance to our field staff, you know, when creating new location records and things like that. And so um, we're working with human resources, we're working with our central licensing team to make this possible. And so I have the position description um, that's been approved by the Department of Administration. Um, the classification I think is gonna be a licensing specialist and we're hoping to get that posted soon. And I wanna pull somebody in from our internal team, somebody that has that technical knowledge, has seen the devices out in the field, understands um, what all of our special fee codes and different things mean so that we can get the ball rolling on providing that customer service sooner than later. Um, and so our central licensing team, the plan is for them to continue to handle anything in person. So if you have a registered service representative that needs to go in and take an exam, that would still happen 
down on the first floor over the parking garage over there, 1010 West Washington. They would take in any in-person applications, payments, and they would forward anything appropriately to our um, licensing person, which would work remotely from home um, and be able to interface with the customers that way. All, they'll have a dedicated phone line just for our licensing team. Um, my plan is to have a dedicated email just for weights and measures licensing so that we can make sure that customer service response is done in a timely manner. So um, our central licensing team, they've really been working hard to try to meet the demands um, you know, of our customers, but they've just had a challenge like we've had in the past of hiring people and retaining people. Um, and so it's hard to find you know, candidates that can work down there. And so they've really been trying their hardest to do it. And hopefully this will give them some relief so they can focus their efforts on, on other, um, other divisions, other areas. So that um, is really exciting for us. And we're also looking into the possibility of you know, if there are any other positions, uh, obviously we could always use more people out in the field, investigators, but, you know, I want to make sure that our investigators are, are trained properly, that their work is being done consistently. And so I'm, I'm evaluating with our team if we want to, you know, establish any other roles there. But right now, um, it looks like this licensing position, the specialist for weights and measures, um, is going to move forward. And so when we post that, I think for now it'll be done internally. Um, but I have had some interest from our staff out in the field um, on possibly transitioning to that type of role. So, so um, look forward to that. Uh, we do have two um, investigators who are retiring, one at the end of August and one in January of next year. And so those positions we will obviously um, work to fill once they leave. Um, both of these individuals have over 20 years experience. Um, with weights and measures. And so we're losing quite a bit of um, knowledge there. Um, you know, but th for personal reasons, they've just decided it's the right time to retire. And I totally respect that. And so we've brought on a new person kind of in the central and southern Arizona area. Her name is Lauren. She's based out of Casa Grande. Um, and she's been working with uh, some of the folks who will be retiring to. Um, you know, start filling in uh, where they will be uh, leaving, you know, in the coming months. And so she's been doing really well. She actually came from California, a weights and measures agency in Amador County, California. And it's the first person since I've been with weights and measures that we've hired that actually had previous weights and measures experience. So the learning curve, it's been amazing to, she's just hit the ground running and she's doing really well. She's actually up in Flagstaff this week um, practicing propane meters. Um, and she knew how to do that already. And it's like, wow, that's something that typically people don't, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. And the county that she came from, mm -hmm, the county that she came from was rel relatively small population wise. And so they only had a couple of inspectors that worked part time throughout the year, but they had to do everything. Whereas we have people that you know, we'll focus on specific areas. And so she had a lot of that experience. We've learned that there's some differences in the way that they do things in California versus Arizona. You know, our regulations are a little different. So, but she's been doing really well. So, um, you know, as far as, as our staff resources are moving along right now, things are really going well for us. Um, we're excited that we're able to add some additional resources. You know, we're not going to go crazy and, you know, double our staff or anything like that. But we definitely have some needs that can help out our team, our customers, um, and make sure that we're really carrying out our mission, um, you know, for our agency. And so we're looking forward to that. Um, I believe that covers everything with our update um, for weights and measures. Oh, well, one other thing I'll, I'll bring up really quick. So the state metrology lab, um, we have our state metrologist, Brian Sellers, and we have our assistant state metrologist, Morrow, and um, they are going to have a record number of calibrations this year because we've taken on a lot of work um, from other parts of the country where labs have either closed temporarily or they've been closed for a while. Um, so, you know, we're doing work for other weights and measures agencies, um, San Diego County, California, where 
um, certifying all of their equipment, which is a lot. Um, and so they're going to have a record number of calibrations. Typically in a year, they do about eight to 9,000. This year, it looks like we're going to be closer to 11,000 calibrations. And those are individual artifacts. So individual weights or, you know, um, volumetric standards, things like that, that are going through their lab. And that's done by just two people. Um, so they have quite a system going on over there. I usually leave them alone because they know what they're doing. Um, and all the time that they're doing this, they're still having to get their annual accreditation through NIST. They're having to go through lab evaluations to make sure that they're, you know, meeting all the requirements. Our assistant state metrologist, Mauro, is trying to become a signatory so he can sign off on all these certificates. Um, so he's been going through the NIST training. He's got to go in August again. Um, and they've been doing all of that and have this record number of calibrations, and it's just crazy. I mean, we've getting, been getting stuff as far away as like Oklahoma and all over the place, and it's coming into Arizona. So we're really excited about that. I've, I've had conversations with our metrologist going, do you need more people? Do you need a bigger facility? What's going on? And right now he's like, well, we're kind of getting close to our limit, but I think we can handle it. Um, so that's been really good because it's been giving our assistant metrologist Morrow a lot of practice and we've been able to help out, you know, our colleagues in other states and counties um, to get their equipment certified so they can keep doing their work. So that's the other big thing that's been going on for us. And, and um, I remember having the conversation with Brian a couple of years ago going, what is your max limit at this lab? Because it's only so big, you only have so many people. And he said, yeah, 11,000 is probably there. And so we're, we're approaching that, so we'll see what happens. We don't want to turn away work, um, but it may get to that point, and uh, you know, we'll have to see what happens. But um, you know, in California, where they have county weights and measures agencies, um, there's a lab in Los Angeles County, but they've been closed for whatever reason, and so Sacramento is kind of the next place for people to send stuff, and they're pretty backed up because you have 58 counties in California. And, you know, they have work coming in from other states as well. And there used to be a lab in Las Vegas and Nevada. They closed theirs. So it's like, well, everybody's coming to Arizona. So, uh, Mark, you have a question. Let's just hope Brian doesn't retire. Yeah, well, he, he's, he's still got a few years left. And, um, yeah, he's, uh, he's working to bring Morrow up to speed because I think the plan is that Morrow will eventually take over for him if, if – that plan continues. But Mauro, he has caught on really quick. Um, you know, he used to be in the field. He used to be one of our investigators and he transitioned to the lab. Um, he really enjoys it over there. Um, it's highly technical, more so than being out in the lab. And there's a lot of equations and you have to monitor the environmental controls and everything. Um, and he's been really doing a great job. So, so yeah, hopefully Brian, you know, stays there for now and, and, uh, you know, we can keep moving along. But yeah, I thought the same thing. And you had mentioned it's probably been a couple of years ago that there was talk of a new facility for them because of where it was located and the traffic and all that kind of stuff around it. Is that still something that's being explored? Um, it's a dream that I have, but uh, it's it's easier said than done. Um, yeah, we we spoke with the Department of Administration about that a few years ago, and um, well, it seems like a few years ago, um, and we we all agreed that the best solution would probably be a, a brand new facility um, to get everything the way that you want it to be able to expand our scope. Uh, to be Echelon 1 for mass, which is the very, very, very precise, you know, mass standards, test weights, um, which is something we can't do in our current facility. Um, and part of the issue is, well, the valley continues to expand. They continue to have freeways and infrastructure. So you're just going to have to keep moving out and out and out to find a location. And it's amazing that this location in Glendale has been able to to work as well as it has, you know, with the infrastructure that's going along. But like if they ever expand light rail out that direction, then we're gonna be forced to move, you know, or if the flight path changes, we're gonna be forced to move because you get those vibrations that impact our equipment. I mean, we can feel earthquakes that happen in Alaska, you know, and, and Brian will come in and be like, oh, all the equipment's wonky today, you know, there must've been an earthquake somewhere. That's how sensitive it is. And so, 
Um, I think when we talked with ADOA, that kind of spooked them a little bit. They're like, oh, wow, well, it's not just that easy. Because they said, well, can you move it down here to the Capitol Mall area? And I said, no, definitely not. Airplanes are flying over. You got railroad tracks right there, freeways on every corner. I said, that's not going to work. And so, um, so it is still a thought right now our facility is doing well you know the management company for the property they're very responsive to the maintenance needs that we have and you know brian's been working there since um i think 2009 he's been the metrologist at that facility um and you know he knows it in and out um he has the system so for right now especially with the workload it's like that's what they need to focus on and you know, in the future, I would love to have a brand new facility. I'd love to have a place to store our equipment, like our scale trucks and things like that. Um, uh, that's nice and secured, but, um, you know, it all costs money and we can't afford that on our own. So we'll see. That might be an ask in the future, but for right now, we're doing pretty well. But that's a great question. Um, so that's all that I have for the updates for agriculture and weights and measures. Um, so... We will carry on to the next uh, next item, which if that you, would that would be that would again, be me sir. again. So yeah, all right. Um, so today is kind of a big day. Uh, I, I'm happy to share this with everybody here because you remember I can't remember how long ago it was now, but we started the discussion about a risk based inspection plan. And we went through some exercises on what are the risk factors? What's this plan going to look like? You know, we talked about it a little bit. And that was almost two years ago. And um, since that time, we've done a lot of thinking about it. Um, the plan's changed a lot. But I think we're at a point now um, where we have a very solid plan to focus on areas of risk while still taking a sample of everything that's out there so we can continue to monitor compliance rates um, and do that in consideration of the staff resources that we do have, um, because that's a big thing. You know, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew, um, and we can only do so much because we only have so many people. So um, today I'm going to go through the risk-based inspection plan that's going to be implemented starting next month. I'm going to explain, you know, a general overview of it, how we got to the point that we're at, how things are going to look for the investigators, um, and so um, I'm really excited to show this to you. It's going to be different than the way we've done things, you know, since I started, since I was an investigator. Um, but we're going to try it out. Um, I'm sure it's going to need some adjustments here and there as time goes on. But I'm excited about it. Our staff are ready for it. Um, it outlines clear goals for them, kind of something that we haven't really had before. Um, so I think it'll be, I think it'll work well. So. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to take you over to our worksheet here. Um, and it's gotten pretty complex. I've actually hidden a lot of the stuff that you don't need to see, the calculations that go on, because it can get overwhelming just by taking a look at it. So um, I'm going to share my screen here. All right. So here we are um, at what I call the ribbit sheet. So RIBIT stands for Risk-Based Inspection Tool. And so we have the little frog up in the corner there because RIBIT frogs make the noise. And I thought it would be kind of fun because I was one day I was getting kind of stressed out looking at all this stuff going, I need something fun here. And a coworker of mine said, well, it's called the RIBIT sheet. you know. And I said, well, we need a frog. So I put it up there. It makes me smile when I see it. So uh, that's why the frog is there. It has no other purpose. Um, so... Within the plan, we have our inspection categories, and then we have subcategories. And the subcategories are a new thing because we wanted to get more granular with the data and focus on, um, you know, focus the areas of risk, our resources on those areas a little bit more than just saying, well, you know, retail pricing, we're having low compliance in that category. So all retail pricing, you know, locations are going to be inspected you know more frequently when really it's well maybe the discount stores have a lower compliance rate than the convenience stores or the grocery stores and so we're really pinpointing that risk more so than we were before and so some categories here where we're able to do it um, 
we have divided it out in a subcategory. And so what I had to do was go through our historic inspection data over the past two years, and I had to break it down um, by these subcategories and find the detrimental violations, which are the ones that directly impact the consumer. You know, they could be losing money right there at that transaction versus the technical ones that are more so like a label's missing or, you know, the device isn't sealed properly, things like that. Um, so I went through and did all of that. And in our database currently, locations are classified through a, a old federal system called the um, Standard Industrial Classifications or SIC codes. Um, and so it's just a, a numerical system that assigns a number. For instance, if, if you have a discount store, uh, like a 99 cent only store or a Dollar General or Family Dollar, something like that, um, just as an example, they're coded under 5399. Um, convenience stores, 554123, those are the gas stations with convenience stores, or the 5543 is a convenience store by itself. So that is how we're able to separate things out. So in the past, when we did special projects, we would um, focus, we would, we would pull lists and filter by these classification codes. Um, some of the codes, uh, don't exist for things and so we've made up our own codes so for instance marijuana dispensaries cannabis facilities they're 9515 that's a code that we've assigned on our own and it doesn't mean anything to anybody else but it we can then filter in our reports to those facilities so uh, yeah so specialty stores um so the question was uh, uh cannabis dispensaries uh, for retail pricing, are they under specialty stores? The answer is yes. They would be under there. Anything that's not in those um, beginning categories, they would be in specialty stores. Depending on the type of inspection, some things are break, broken down specifically. So like when we get to packaging, you'll see that cannabis has its own category. Um, scales, because of the, the use for those devices, cannabis has its own category. The same goes for like um, pawn shops and jewelry stores. Um, grocery, things like that. So we'll go through this and I'll show you what we have. And then I'll explain the risk factors and how the calculations are done. So um, retail pricing, we have the categories that you see before you, whoops. Um, convenience stores, department stores, which are um, you know what you'd find at a mall, your Macy's, Dillard's, um, other stores like JCPenney, Kohl's, um, typically clothing retail, but department style stores. Uh, discount stores, uh, which I've already explained, drug stores, pretty self-explanatory, or Walgreens, CVS, those type of locations. Hardware and building supply, um, your Lowe's, Home Depot, Ace Hardware, True Values, places like that. Um, grocery, uh, all the grocery retailers out there. Um, mass merchandise and warehouse. So this includes your Walmarts, your Costco's, your Sam Club, the large stores like that. And then specialty stores are everything else. So it could include a dispensary. It could include um, beauty supply. It could include pool supply, auto parts. There's a whole bunch of categories in there. And the reason we grouped all those together is because the population size is generally smaller than some of these other categories. Um, and it's easy enough for us if we really start to have a challenge in that category you know, with compliance, we can go and pull the reports and still filter it out even more. But I, I didn't want to break it down so that we have 200 categories that our, that our investigators are like, oh, what do I have to do with this? You know, so, so that's where we stopped with retail pricing, and it encompasses everything out there. Um, motor fuel dispensers, well, there's really only one there because they're all used for the same purpose, commercial motor fuel dispensers. Um, high flow, it's its own category. Those are the high flow motor fuel dispensers, so the diesel typically that you'll find for fueling commercial trucks. Um, they have a different tolerance, their design is a little bit different, um, and the reason mainly that these are separated is because they take a lot longer to inspect. When you're pumping 100 gallons at a time, even though it's supposed to come out fast, it doesn't always do that, and you have to go and return your fuel with each time that you fill up the container, the prover. So these inspections where I could test, you know, one pump on a regular dispenser in probably 15 minutes, these, it could take you an hour just to do one draw and dump, especially when you have all these trucks lining up and you're trying to compete with that, it can be challenging. So those are separated out because those inspections historically have taken a lot longer. 
motor fuel quality, um, that one obviously just wherever motor fuel is sold um, out of the dispensers uh, or, you know, even sampling at terminals and things like that, um, motor fuel quality is that category. Uh, and then we have our small capacity scales. So um, we broke some of these down separately because of the way the Auditor General highlighted things in their previous report. So if you remember, they, they highlighted airport scales. They highlighted cannabis scales. And they're going to want to see what we're doing specifically in those areas. And I'm not sure why the focus is on those. Um, but for this plan, those are highlighted separately. Um, grocery, jewelry and pawn, and all other, which is, again, what you typically find at a specialty location, um, specific use cases there. So um, then large capacity scales, uh, those are typically your truck scales or recycling scales. Uh, we have separate categories here. So landfills, uh, we have a lot of transfer stations, a lot of places where the public can go and um, dump uh, trash or um, different materials. And um, so we highlighted those separately because that application is kind of unique in how they do things. Sometimes they do vehicle tear weights. Sometimes the scales used for both inbound and outbound weighments. Um, we have recycling, which encompasses a variety of different scales from vehicle scales down to, you know, five by five foot platform scales, sand, gravel, and concrete. Um, a lot of those facilities, the concrete plants, the materials yards, uh, way master. So these are scales that are used specifically by a public way master um, to produce weight certificates. And then all other, which would be, you know, there's some really specific uses for vehicle scales and industrial scales out there, um, including things like forklift scales and, and so on, uh, that would fall into this last category. All right, packaging, um, cannabis, grocery, and all other, um, you know, grocery is where the bulk of the consumers are typically, um, and Typically, grocery stores have the most products, you know, for people to pick from or the widest variety, you know, thousands and thousands. Um, but that's how we've broken it down right now. We've thought about doing it by packages sold by volume, packages sold by random weight, standard weight, things like that. But um, the differences in some of these types of products, you get into the all other category, you get into the really, really specialized stuff. Um, uh, which can take a lot of time. And so that's why that was separated out. Um, because once you get the hang of doing, you know, a packaging audit, uh, for instance, in a grocery store at the meat department or something like that, that can go fairly quickly. Um, and you can get a good pattern with that. But there are some things um, like that would fit in the all other category. Like we had a complaint this past year on leather, the thickness of leather belts. Um, that's not something you deal with every day. And it's not something that you're actively typically actively going to go out and seek, you know, are these leather belts the right thickness and stuff? Um, that's where the all other fits in is for, for those types of things. So um, it can get interesting. Water venting machines, um, we have, uh, you know, about 4,000 of those in the state. They're a very large category, um, more so than most of the states in the country. Uh, and so those are called out separately. Um, also because they don't take a long time to inspect the tolerance is different, things like that for those. Other liquid measuring devices. This is one category that we haven't focused a lot on in the past. It's bulk meters, um, typically for chemicals or petroleum um, that are, have a higher flow rate than your standard, like a water venting machine, for instance, which is a liquid measuring device, but um, it's, it's tested differently. So that category, um, will include things like airport um, motor fuel dispensers, aviation. They typically have a higher flow rate. And a lot of those, I imagine, will be witnessed inspections. We'll have to coordinate with a service agent to go out there because some of it dispenses at such a high volume that we might not have the right size prover or something to, to test them. So that'll be an interesting one to tackle, but it's separated out. We have propane. Um, if you're a fan of King of the Hill propane and propane accessories, um, we have uh, CNG meters. We only have a handful of those locations, 12 in the state, and we'll be going to all of them, and I'll explain why later, but uh, CNG meters to fill up uh, motor, fuel, uh, motor vehicles. Gasoline vapor recovery, 
Um, we have area A called out. That's the Phoenix area where we're sitting right now. Um, separate from area B because area B doesn't have that annual testing requirement. Area B is just when a station is modified or built, um, we go down and do the vapor recovery inspections there. But area A is where that annual requirement happens. And so that's why it's, it's considered in here. Public Waymaster um, is its own category. And then we have timing devices, air and water machines, car wash, and laundry. Those are kind of the three main applications for those devices. And the devices are a little bit different in how they operate. So, and then we reach the end of it there. So those are the categories that the workload is going to be distributed across. Um, and, you know, there may be some adjustments, like I said, we might get to the end of this plan after two years and go, okay, you know, we need to kind of change things up um, based on feedback that we get from, you know, our investigators from industry, things that we experience out in the field. But for right now, um, I, I think we have things broken down well enough to, like I said, focus on the risk where, where we might find it. Um, any questions about any of the categories so far? Sure. You mentioned that it's implementing next month. Is that uh, July is the start of the implementation or? Yeah, July, July is the start. Um, we have a meeting on July 12th to go over this in detail and really to explain to the investigators how it's all going to work and how to track their goals and things like that. Um, in some of these areas, we haven't completed our training program yet. And so they'll come along later um, as time goes on and as we get people trained. Um, so, you know, we'll, we're trying to focus on retraining everybody in each category. We've done a lot so far. <laughs> So we're gonna start with those that people are comfortable with and slowly add things on over the next course of the two years. So they'll come into play, but but yeah. The other thing that you know can affect stuff is obviously employee turnover. If I lose somebody who's part of the plan here, then I have to make some adjustments, but it, it's adaptable to those situations. For instance, I have two people that are retiring in the next year. They're separate from the main plan because I know that they're not going to be here for a full two years. So um, it's, it's adjusted accordingly. Any other questions? All right. So then um, we have our risk factors. So um, this was one that we went through a lot, you know, with the advisory council previously, we talked about risk factors. We came up with several, it was consolidated down really to one, which was the compliance rate because everything is related to that compliance rate. And if I expand this really quick, we have our detrimental compliance rate and our technical compliance rate. And again, the difference between the two is the type of violation. So if you have a meter, for instance, that is shorting the consumer, that is a detrimental violation. Um, and that has a higher weight to the um, compliance rate score here than the technical violation. So if that same fuel dispenser where the meter shorting the consumer has a missing label, that type of violation is a technical violation. And this goes kind of in line with our enforcement action. So, you know, if we find a meter that's shorting the consumer, it's going to be placed out of service right away because of the detrimental nature of the violation. But there are some things where we might issue a warning tag, you know, give a time frame to correct. Those are more of the technical issues where as long as you fix them within that time frame, we're good to go. Um, and that can be applied across all different types of devices. Um, it can be applied to retail pricing. You know, a detrimental violation is an overcharge or a price not posted, but a technical violation is, well, your display is not facing the consumer or you don't have a price error policy. Those are things that will give you a time frame to, to correct. So the detrimental is weighted um, more heavily than the technical. Uh, and so you might have a location that, um, you know, has, has a, for instance, a high compliance rate detrimental. So air and water machines, you know, at fuel stations, they're typically accurate, but we found a lot of technical violations with them, labeling, things like that. And so those technical violations aren't considered as heavily as if they weren't accurate, because ultimately we want to make sure that, you know, the accuracy of the device is kind of the key thing when it comes to weights and measures, making sure that people get what they're paying for and that the businesses aren't losing money. Um, and so that's what's 
focused on that that row 31 there. So that risk score um, is then developed into a compliance rate risk score. And it's just converted into a number because I needed everything to be like numbers so that they could be kind of summed together easily. Um, and so it's converted into a number here through a formula. Um, and so the higher the number, the higher risk, um, what we've identified from historical inspection data. This is not anything we're making up. This is from previous inspection data. And that's the key here. That's what the Auditor General was looking for. They want us to focus on, well, you've done inspections. Where have you found the risk? That's what you need to focus on. And so um, if we're doing more inspections in the category, it's because we need to do more inspections. There's, you know, non-compliance that we need to address. Um, the next one, so I sent out a survey a couple of different places. I sent it out internally within our department. I sent it out on our listserv, our distribution list. Um, and it's a consumer survey. And it was saying, as a consumer, what areas are most important to you? Um, because I've wanted to do a public survey for a long, long time. I felt like that was kind of the area that was missing in this. And so, unfortunately, we don't have the means at this point to conduct a widespread public survey, you know, like, I, I don't even know how that would be done. And that's something I want to investigate in the future is, you know, I want to see what the people want. You know, they're paying tax dollars for us to go out there. What do they want us to focus on? And so I sent out these surveys to people who everybody's a consumer. And I said, look at this from the perspective of, of a consumer and tell me what is most important to you. Where should we focus? And so I got actually a good number of responses back that I could develop an importance score here. This is the consumer's perspective that's being focused in here. So if a consumer, you know, thinks that we should focus on fuel dispensers or timing devices or whatever, then we're going to take that into consideration as well. Because we do get a lot of feedback from our complainants, especially when they contact us. Um, and so these scores uh, down below, row 37, um, are developed from the responses that I got. And it was just a numerical score. And I was able to um, uh, determine an average uh, in each category. So it was a scale one to five, five being most important, one being least important. I mean, it was interesting to see how people responded. I mean, there was quite a widespread difference between some consumers, you know. And so I converted that just into a number um, that I could add uh, into into the risk uh, score yes there's a question yeah kevin on the uh compliance uh the risk factor score is there a range or a, some sort of scale that you were able to determine like zero to 200 or um, just, just the number that's a great question yeah well zero obviously you know is meaning 100% in the categories. And so like a category CNG meters, for instance, um, we haven't tested all of the sites in the past, but the ones that we've tested so far, they've been accurate. Um, the highest number I think we have here, if I go back through it, um, it was that category we were looking at. 107, public way master has been a real challenge. That was an area that for whatever reason, we hadn't focused on a lot in the past several years. And um, so we've gone out there and we found a lot of issues with licenses or people not being licensed. Um, we found some issues with record keeping and things like that. And so that's the highest one I think we have so far um, is public way master for the, the compliance rate. So the scale right now would be zero to 107, but potentially, I mean, if you have a really low compliance rate in a category, that number could get higher. Um, so the scale could widen or narrow itself over time. And, you know, it, it's not really so much how it relates to these other categories. It's just how it relates to the violations that you're finding, the compliance rate. Um, and it just becomes a number. And the higher the number, the more weight is going to be put in that category. The higher number of inspections it's going to dictate for us. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. All right. So then um, this last one here, so we receive funding specifically for two programs, our cleaner burning gasoline, uh, which is heavily tied into motor fuel quality and gasoline vapor recovery. 
Um, and because we received that specific appropriation, we felt that it was necessary to add a multiplier in there so that even though some of those categories may have a lower risk, because we're tasked with making sure that those air quality programs are working properly. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the sky out in the valley this week, but it's not looking great, you know. And, um, you know, so we're tasked with enforcing that program to try and clean up that air. Um, and uh, so we felt that a, a weight needs to be put on those categories so we have a greater number of inspections to continue to, to monitor those categories and and use that funding accordingly and so that is where the third risk factor comes in which is the air quality funding multiplier and so when you combine all of those together you get a combined risk score and that is what is then in the calculation and so again higher the risk score the more inspections you're going to have so that's the detailed version of it before we get to the numbers um, on each category um, the other thing we have to focus on is over the course of two years, you need to at least conduct a minimum sample in each category so that you get those compliance rates that are realistic. Because if I do two inspections over the course of two years, one passes and one fails, my compliance rate is 50%, but that's not a good sample size. And so I have to look at the number total number of locations that we have within the state and I go through, there's actually a website that I go through, sample size calculator, and I plug in these parameters, and then boom, it tells me, okay, if you have 6,000 locations, you're gonna need to do 320 inspections, at least to maintain your compliance rate. So in each category, at a minimum, I have to do what's in this row 45 right here. So that's why CNG meters, um, and there's some rounding, rounding issues um, in the form that I, I have to work out a little bit, but CNG meters, that's why we have to do 100% of those because there's only 11 or 12 locations. So I need to get the full sample there. If you've ever done statistical analysis and things like that, the sample size is is a big deal when it comes to having confidence in in your sample results. Yeah. Is, are, is this per, I, I'm, I, this may be a ridiculous question, but is this per month or per year when you use these numbers, these inspection numbers? So this is actually over the course of two years. So the plan implementation is 24 months. Um, and the reason that we did that is, is to give us enough time and to spread things out. Initially, it was going to be a year, and then it was going to be 18 months, and the, the remaining six months was going to be doing our compliance sample. And I said, well, let's just group it all together so that people have one number that they have to worry about over two years. Let's make it easy for them. So the compliance sample, when you see the inspection numbers in the next row, it's already taking those into consideration. And then it says, okay, I've given you the compliance sample. Now, what is the risk score? And do I need to add more inspections or not? So at a minimum, you're gonna be doing what's in this row 45, and then it might add more depending on risk and things like that. I have another question as well. Yeah. Um, let's say that the, it's a car wash and laundry combo. Will the inspector inspector be able to do it one time and count off their inspection for multiple yeah, so categories? The way that we'll look at that is we'll look at it as, as really one inspection and we'll have them do a separate inspection to cover another location, either car wash or laundry, whichever one they pick. Um, just so that we're trying to do the greatest number of inspections that we can. When you see the numbers, it's not going to look like a lot. Um, but I, I tried to be really conservative with this going into it for the first time because there are certain categories in here, like I said, where we haven't placed a lot of focus in the past and we have to train staff in some categories. So there's going to be a learning curve. It's going to take us more time initially to do things. That and I have to consider that, you know, we're going to get probably an average of a thousand complaints a year we're probably going to have reinspections that result from these. And there's new criteria as to when reinspections are scheduled if a certain level of risk is identified, which is another thing that, you know, the Auditor General had called out. So, um, so there's room for those inspections to be done as well um, based on the number of work hours that we have available for all of our staff. So um, the risk-based is part of it. And then there's things that we you know, have to do. We have to respond to consumer complaints. I can't say, well, uh, you know, that consumer complaint's not very risky, so we're not going to go out in that one. No, we're mandated to respond to those consumer complaints. And so those are considered separately way up above. Um, and 
the investigators goals when they get them they don't include those other things that are going to happen anyway um, and just to help you understand anything here any of the data that's orange is data that i have to manually put in here anything that's black the form the the worksheet is calculating it so that's the difference between orange and black it's just so i know what do I need to update? Because when I get to the end of this plan, about three months before it ends, I have to go through and refresh everything with the inspection data that we pulled for the last two years. So, all right. So then we have our row 46 here, which is the actual numbers. And I put it in big green letters. So if anything, that's what you focus on. This is the workload distribution that, uh, or the workload that we're gonna have over the next couple of years just for risk-based inspections. Keep in mind, there's other inspections that are going to occur for complaints and reinspections and things like that, but this is the number. And so we go down the line and some of them will be small because right now the risk factor, the risk score is low. Um, some of them will be higher. And um, again, all of these could result in reinspections. If we go out to a location, um, you know, we could, identify that, hey, there's a problem here. We need to come back and take another look at this, um, have the location implement some corrective actions. So anything that's these big green bold numbers, that is the workload that gets split up amongst our staff. These gray ones are just summarizing what's in that main category, but the subcategories are what, what we factor in. So we go down the line um, and those are the numbers that then get put into our workload distribution. So then I have to go and say, okay, I have this many investigators right now, which I have 12 currently that are factored into the plan. I have to take all of the workload, the number of inspections that it's telling me to do, and I have to split it up e evenly amongst them because I don't want to overload somebody um, and then you know, underload somebody else. And so I did this all manually. We were originally going to develop a, a formula to calculate it out. And I, I said, I want to try it manually first. And so that's what I did. And it worked really well. Yes, there's a question. Ooh, was there a question? I, I thought I heard. Yeah, sorry, it was a, in, in message. Sorry. Will there be a version of this spreadsheet available for distribution? And I'm sorry, who, who's asking the question? I'm sorry, this is uh, Dallas member. I apologize. Oh, okay. Um, so the answer is no. Um, this is something that we're going to keep internal uh, just for our staff. Um, uh, and also just for open meeting law and etiquette, um, if, if you're not an advisory council member, unfortunately, um, questions must be saved for the, the call to the public at the end. I would love to answer the questions right now, but I have to follow those open meeting law protocols. So we will have a call to the public at the end where you can ask questions or ask the advisory council to look into a specific issue. Um, uh, so please feel free to use that time accordingly. But I will answer your question right now. The answer is no, this isn't going to be something that we're going to publish out there. Um, it's just for our internal use. And I'm uh, I'm presenting it today to give you an expectation of what our inspection plan will look like, you know, especially since the advisory council has been heavily involved in discussions about the risk-based plan over the past couple of years. Um, you know, this is the direction that we're heading going forward. So, so. All right. I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, I was curious, um, is for the inspections, is that going to just be, kind of assigned randomly among the licenses or is there going to be any kind of metric to, you know, maybe I lean toward, you know, maybe like repeat offenders or, you know, higher risk um, licensees? That is a great question. And we'll get to that here okay. shortly. Yep. There's some criteria that people, uh, our investigators will be following. Yeah. So they just aren't picking things randomly. Um, yeah. So, Workload distribution, I'm not gonna go into this in detail. You know, my goal here is to make sure that everybody has pretty much even number of hours. Um, and so I, I did that. Again, you can see the available inspection hours that they have to do risk-based only is 12 or 1300, depending on where they're located in the state. 
I was conservative with this because like I said, I don't want to overload people. I don't want to stress people out going into this. And if we find at the end that we have more time to do things, then we'll just add more inspections on. It's really easy to do that. So if we can get this done initially and kind of go through, um, uh, you know, the experiment, so to speak, and, and uh, find out that, hey, we can do more than we predicted we can do, then great. Um, but I, I'd rather have it be, we can do more than, uh, we can't do what we said we were going to do. So I don't want to be the person that, that, uh, you know, uh, has that happen. So, um, yeah, so, uh, the location selection procedure. So I'll go over this, um, briefly. In fact, I think I've kind of shown everything. I'll, I'll show you what the investigator, um, goals worksheet looks like. So this is where I can go in and track. And so I run reports from our database. Um, and then I put the number of inspections that they completed in this category. And then they have a separate spreadsheet that is just for them that shows them all the things they need to do. And as it gets updated, it communicates to that worksheet and it says, hey, you accomplished this, this, and this. And that'll be updated weekly. That's going to be my job is monitoring all of that. And so they have real-time communication basically on how they're doing with their goals because one of our things is we want to monitor their performance over time and we want to make sure that their goals are clearly communicated to them. Uh, and so with this, you know, the expectations set out before them, um, their supervisors can go through and, and have that conversation if they're not meeting in a certain area or if they're kind of overachieving in a certain area and like, hey, maybe let's redirect our focus here or there. Um, so that is how the goals work. Um, I'll stop presenting here and I'll explain, I'll answer your question, Eric, about selecting locations. So um, there are several things we have to be conscious of here. Uh, one is obviously, when was the last inspection done? Uh, and so one of the selection criteria is looking at the locations that were inspected the longest time ago. We wanna go back there and focus on those first. Um, the second one is to make sure that our travel is efficient. Um, and so if we go to a location where we can do multiple inspections, we're going to do multiple inspections. I'm not going to let this plan get in the way of us, you know, not making our trip worthwhile. Um, and with some of our staff, especially in the more rural areas of the state, travel is a big deal. I mean, you're traveling two hours to get to a location, two hours home that's a lot of time spent in your 10 hour day just behind the wheel. And so it's like, okay, if we're going out to Sholo or wherever, I wanna make sure that the trip's worthwhile. Um, then the second one is whatever's along your travel route. So if you don't have anything else to do at that location or you have time that's freed up before you go home, okay, what's between there and your home? Or what's between there and the next place that you have to go? You know, Maybe you have to come into the office. Is there anything that you can do between here and there? Um, within your inspection district. And so that is the next criteria that they use. And then again, the same thing applies. If you go to a location, you can do more than one inspection and you have the time to do it, then by all means do it. Make sure that your trip is efficient because I'd rather have one person spend all day doing you know, four or five inspections at a single location than make four or five separate trips to that location, especially when you know you can probably complete things in multiple categories, you know, satisfy your goals there that way. So then the next thing is um, if we have a location where we find a valid detrimental complaint, so we go and customer says, and this is just as an example, not trying to single anybody out here, but um, that motor fuel dispenser, the meter's not accurate. We go there and we find that it's shorting the consumer. Well, what we're going to do is schedule a follow-up inspection for six months from the date of that to go back and check that meter again. Um, and that's going to be a full inspection of the site because, um, you know, if we identify that there's valid complaints, we're going to go out and, and do that inspection regardless of the last time that we've inspected it. Because one of the things was with when you identify risk, your inspection frequency needs to increase. And that's, you know, already inherently done in the plan. But then we're taking it a step further by going, OK, we've had this valid complaint. We're going to go back there. Um, and that's just on detrimental, you know, if, if, if it's something like the price sign was incorrect or, you know, the auto shut off didn't work, that's not considered detrimental. Those are technical complaints. We're not going to 
you know, schedule a follow-up inspection for that. We may schedule a tag reinspection. So if we ask the location or if we require the location to repair it, we'll schedule a tag reinspection to check up to make sure that the repair was done completely. That's done separately as part of our reinspection program. And we've been doing that now for probably close to a year. We've had that implemented. Um, so yeah, so that'll be done. Then we have, um, if I go to a location and I'll use scales and as, as an example this time, um, let's say we have a location that has 15 scales. If we go there and you know, four of those scales are shorting the consumer, they have those detrimental violations, we're gonna reschedule um, that location for another inspection within six months because we found a lot of risk there. I mean, if you find you know, that many devices that are shorting the consumer, there's some type of problem going on there um, and we're gonna follow up on that accordingly. And this type of reinspection system is very similar to how other states do it. Uh, a lot of other states will typically require a reinspection of some sort um, after any inspection, you know, if they find a violation. And, and in, in the past, we've relied on the service personnel to, to correct a lot of those and then the location to continue their maintenance. Well, now we're gonna follow up on those a little bit more. Like I said, and, and it's only at a certain level of non-compliance, right? It, it, if you have a couple of devices, you know, things go out of adjustment, we get it. But if you have a bunch of devices that are all kind of out of adjustment in the same direction, you know, that makes us a little bit more, well, what's going on here? We need to investigate that further. And so we'll follow up that way. And so, you know, those will be unannounced reinspections. They could happen, you know, at six months or any time after whenever the investigator's there. Um, but it's not something we'll go to the location and say, hey, when can we come back? We'll just come back. But those reinspections are separate from these? Yes. Goals. Okay. Yeah, that's why the numbers are so conservative because we're going to have some additional reinspections to follow up on things. You know, I'll, I'll give an example. I, when I was out in the field, there was one particular location. Uh, if you know what a meter jump is on a fuel dispenser, um, it's where you authorize the dispenser and it immediately jumps to a certain dollar amount in volume before you've pumped any fuel. And there's different reasons that it could happen. But this location, we were consistently getting complaints and those complaints were always valid. And we would go back and we started a, a structured reinspection program for the site. And every time we'd go back, you know, the same problems were being identified. And it got to a point where our enforcement action had to be heightened up to a certain level. And, you know, we had to put pressure on the location to figure it out. And it was, it was an issue that was, um, you know, not just related to the dispensers, it was actually within their, their fuel pumping system from the tanks. Um, and so they got it corrected and the complaints have stopped, you know, the dispensers aren't jumping anymore, but it was one of those things where it's like, okay, you know, maybe it's just a dispenser issue, but we started seeing it repeatedly and it's like, no, there's more to this. We got to do more investigation. Um, and so that's an example of how that could lead. Um, so that's how the location selection is going to work. That's the criteria that our staff are going to work off of. Um, and it's more structured than it ever has been in the past. You know, we used to have the, you know, not seen in three years list is what we would go by. So if it hasn't been seen in three years, you know, okay, go out and inspect it. But now it's more so let's focus on the efficiency of travel. Let's focus on those areas of high risk that we've found. Um, and so this inspection plan is, is going to be, you know, conducive of that. So, so yeah, and that, that's basically it for the inspection plan. Again, we're gonna start rolling it out next month, um, you know, stages little by little. Uh, you know, as far as our inspections, when we come to do an inspection at your location, um, what we expect of the location, you know, we'll present the regulatory bill of rights, we'll, we'll probably need some sort of assistance from a location representative. That's not gonna change, you know, it's just the manner in which um, we're, directing our staff resources to do inspections. So any additional questions about that? I know it's a lot to go through and I try not to bore people with it because I can, I, I, I've spent a lot of time with it and I can get really into the details and people just glaze over. Um, so I don't want that to happen. I just have a quick question on the detrimental complaints. It sounds like that's your uh, high priority for you guys. It, when it's the initial complaint from the consumer, do you have a standard time frame that you have to go to the location? Yes, so all of our complaints we respond to within 10 days, except 
for um, used to be credit card skimmer complaints. We don't get those anymore, but those were one business day and motor fuel quality complaints we respond to within one business day. So, you know, obviously if we get a complaint on a Friday, we'll be out there on Monday, but if I get a complaint on a Thursday, I'm sending somebody out that same day or Friday to, to respond. And then you mentioned the six month reinspection up into the point of it being resolved. Yeah, so the reinspections, um, you know, could continue if the non-compliance um, continues typically with a progressive kind of enforcement action and reinspection like that. The goal is to get the location to work towards compliance so that we don't have to do that. Um, one of the things that we've changed over the past year with the high number of retail pricing violations that we've had, in particular overcharges, it used to be, you know, we would do a reinspection after seven days and those would just continue and continue and continue until the location passed. Well, we were getting locations that 10, 15 reinspections, their civil penalties are astronomical at that point and they're not doing anything to fix it. And so we found that obviously that's not working. That's not the solution. And so there'll be a certain point if you have repeated non-compliance where we reach out, you know, at the company level, at the corporate level, and we're starting to find solutions there. Um, and we've engaged, you know, particular companies, we've engaged their corporate level staff and said, hey, this is a problem. We've identified it at multiple locations. We give them the data and we say, this needs to change because, you know, it can get higher above that. We never want to go the route of, you know, working with the attorney general on some big, you know, consumer fraud case. But that kind of stuff has happened in other states. It could happen here. Hopefully we never get to that point. But um, that's kind of what we've started to do in some categories like retail pricing, where you get to that third reinspection. Okay, they're not changing their behavior. We have to address it at a different level. And so the same, I believe, will be said for any other category. It's like, if we're continuing to have to do these reinspections, we need to talk to somebody else and engage them and, and provide some education rather than just continuing to kind of, you know, not use our time efficiently, not use their time efficiently and, you know, rack up these civil penalties unnecessarily when we could find a solution another way. So there you go. I was curious, um, as far as like the inspections for the uh, stage, the vapor recovery, the stage uh, area A, um, I know that uh, we've heard that there might be just starting up some of the vapor compliance inspections separate from the um, like initial witness, I mean, the like state witness inspections. Yep. Is that going to be more in a separate, the, like VOCs, will that qualify as one of those inspections or is that, set, or is that more uh, witnessed inspections as far as vapor recovery? So that's a category where it'll probably be separate for now because we have to collect data. Okay. We have to see what the compliance is gonna be there and we have to make sure that our procedure is solid. So it, it's probably gonna be in kind of a test phase at first uh, in partnership with our registered service agencies um, at our training classes that are coming up next month. That's gonna be a conversation item along with the new um, torque test procedure, because um, we've been doing some research on that and, and uh, we've been going out and doing some testing with that and, and identifying some things. And so we're gonna have that conversation and initially it'll be separate because we need to generate that compliance rate. Um, for those who aren't familiar with um, gasoline vapor recovery and the history of it, we used to do vapor compliance inspections when we had stage two. Um, you know, that were kind of unannounced uh, aside from the annual testing. And so we're looking to bring that back um, for the stage one systems to get an idea of how they're operating throughout the year. Because usually when we go and test them, um, you know, they've already been kind of evaluated by the service personnel um, to ensure that they're compliant. Uh, and so we just want to make sure that through normal operation out in the field, they're continually making sure that gasoline vapors aren't getting into the atmosphere. Um, and so, you know, hopefully when we go out there, we find that, hey, these systems are working perfectly fine. And, you know, it doesn't become a big category in future plans, but we have to investigate that first. And so Vince and Michelle Wilson um, have been doing a lot of research on that and putting together a, a test procedure for it. So yeah, great question. And then just one final question: Are are the all of the inspections going to continue to be 
uh, you know, more on an unannounced um, random type basis. I know the ADEQ has kind of tried to take a little bit more of a proactive approach as far as giving a notification that an inspection is upcoming. Um, so I was just curious if, if you guys were going to just continued with uh, more unannounced type yeah, inspections. Yeah, we're going to continue with unannounced everywhere we can because we find that's the best way to get a representation of how the devices are operating, how the business is operating. You know, if we give people a heads up, it, it's kind of like when we do evaluations on our field staff, we found that if we give people a heads up that their supervisor is going to be out there observing them do an inspection, well, they're going to be on their best behavior, of course. They're going to follow everything by the book. And so it's like, well, how do you get the representation of how things are really working? And that's not to say that, um, you know, locations, locations will be, you know, a whole lot different than they would be if we just walked in unannounced. But I worked at a hotel one time uh, just just down the street over here, and they would have these auditors come through. They're like secret shoppers, right? And it's to make sure that your hotel's meeting up to brand standards and things. Well, somehow my supervisor would always know when these people are coming. And so it's like, well, we got to be on our best behavior and make sure that your uniform's great and make sure that somebody's always standing here. And it's like, how are we ever going to improve, you know, if 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 we're always, you know, getting these scores? Yeah, it's like, that's not the point of this exercise, you know, but I think our supervisors, you know, they kind of had um, their performance evaluations and stuff were on the line when these people came. And so it's like, no, we, we need the realistic example. And so that's the purpose of unannounced inspections. But there may be certain instances, like I mentioned, with the other liquid measuring device category, those really big high flow meters, we may need assistance and have to pre-schedule those. You know, we have some inspections like a, a card lock, a, a unmanned fuel site um, where it's just commercial fueling only by credit card. We have to have those scheduled ahead of time because we can't just go in there and get the dispensers authorized. So there'll be certain situations, but wherever we can, it'll be unannounced. Great questions. Uh, for me, First of all, I love that spreadsheet and how much time and energy you put into it. It's it's absolutely phenomenal to look and see. I would I'm kind of with the gentleman who asked the question. I would love to see how that proceeds. So that was maybe my first question. Will the advisory council here maybe get updates once a quarter on how that's proceeding and what the the findings that way? Absolutely. If that's what the council desires, um, that can be an agenda item going forward. I mean, definitely in this first two year period. And, you know, the other thing um, that that could possibly happen. I mean, I, I've talked to our new director, Briarly, about it. And, you know, this was a concern of mine. It's like we go through all this work and somebody might come in and say, well, I have a different way of looking at things. And I have to go with, you know, obviously what what the director would want, but I've communicated about this a little bit and, and the plan sounds um, like it'll continue to go forward. There's no concerns there, um, but there could be things that change, um, you know, either from the governor's office or other factors that come in, uh, you know, who knows what the future will bring for us, but the plan is to implement this over the next two years and absolutely we can give updates on how things are going and show the progress. I mean, I can, you know, show how I, I would love to see that just personally, yep. see how, yeah, see how I would like that to be added as well right. as an agenda item. Yeah. If we could check in on these quarterly meetings right. on where we're standing. Okay. And then my other question, I've never seen a reinspection notification. I don't know if it just comes through I from, from the retail perspective or scale perspective. I see that, you know, Hey, we'll be back within seven days to check. I don't remember seeing those. Do those come out? regularly just as as if it was a regular inspection um so it, it it depends because with retail pricing we the the investigators should be documenting that a reinspection will occur on or after seven days um, but for everything else um like if we tagged out a scale for instance we're not going to announce that because we may or may not come back and do a reinspection there there's a certain percentage of tags that we follow up on um, excuse me. And, um, so, you know, we, we typically don't announce that we'll be coming back and doing those reinspections again, just to get that representation to make sure that the location really corrected it on their own initiative and that it was done the correct way. Um, 
you know, but uh, if there are times where, you know, we know that reinspection is going to happen, like I said, in retail pricing, um, that should be communicated to the location personnel and then also in the inspection report. And so if that's not happening, um, that's definitely something we can address. Okay. I, I just wondered because I don't seem to remember seeing anything called out as a specific reinspection, yeah. but I do see that comment, especially on scales where it says, hey, we're fine there and there. It needs to be adjusted, whether it be. And the thing that I really appreciate is that they'll also tell us that, hey, your your company is losing money because of how it's registered. Absolutely. Not, not necessarily just it's detriment to the consumer, but also, hey, if you get this fixed right, you're going to go ahead and save yourself or, or make a little bit more money that way. So I appreciate the teamwork that you guys have always shown with us. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, if, if you receive an inspection report from us, um, when you look at that first page that just has the information about the location we inspected and the inspector time and things like that, there will be a three-letter code up in one of the top corners. I haven't, I haven't been out in the field in a while, so I can't remember where, but it'll say like REI is a reinspection or it'll say tag, T-A-G, is a tag reinspection. So we're following up on a previous enforcement tag that we issued. And typically they're red tags because what we're looking for is we're making sure that um, placed and service reports are submitted and that the device is compliant with Handbook 44 when it's placed back into service. So if you remember initially in this inspection plan, we had a separate category for registered service agency and representative. And we started to ask ourselves, what does that inspection look like? Are we going to go to their office and what are we going to do there? You know, like, show me your paperwork. That That's not a good way to do it. The real way to evaluate, you know, what the work that the service personnel are doing is to make sure, is to go back and test the device that they worked on and to make sure that they're complying with all of our requirements. And so, um, so that's something that's been happening, uh, you know, recently. And we have found some issues and we have found you know, some folks that are doing things the right way. But the main thing is to ensure that the proper follow-up, you know, what those service personnel are licensed to do is basically be agents, you know, of us. We don't have enough people to go out there, so we can't go out and, you know, certify every device and seal them like we used to back in the day. Um, and so that's where the licensed personnel come into play. And so we need to make sure that they're they're following the rules and they're doing it doing it the right way. And so it's just a way to hold people accountable um, you know, just like we hold our own investigators accountable when they're doing an inspection or a location accountable when we're doing an inspection. So, um, so yeah. Okay. Well, I think I've talked enough here. Um, we're almost an hour and a half into the meeting, so we'll move along, um, really quickly. I'll share the agenda here so we can see where we're at. All right. It looks like we are down to the call to the public. Just wanted to go ahead and open up the floor, see if there are any questions, comments from anybody that's on the call. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Lucia DeVernay with Copper State Farms, and I know that our relationship in the cannabis industry is new with the department. So. Um, we have a few questions about uh, how that's going to proceed. So one of the things we wanted to know is uh, what is the average um, duration of an inspection and what we can expect from your inspectors to do if they do find uh, cannabis items that are non-compliant, whether with labeling or any other of your regulations? That is a great question. Um, average duration. I actually have some numbers. Let's go take a look. You're gonna see all the stuff I, everything that I, everything that I hid. Here it comes. So yeah, there's there's within our our risk based tool here. Um, there's location data, which is very simple. It's just the number of locations um, in each category and the percentage of those locations as it compares to the big picture. How many places do we regulate? Period. Um, but the inspection data. Uh, we're going through and we're saying, okay, annual average number of inspections, we convert things into hours, you know. When our um, investigators log their inspections in our database, um, it records things in minutes. So the report I get says, you know, they were there for 72 minutes. Um, and because I'm working in work hours, 
um, I convert everything into hours so that I can just have the same unit um, like units for each other. So let's go look at where we are here, cannabis. So the average um, cannabis scale inspection of the ones we've done so far uh, is 2.1 hours. Um, and um, that may, it probably, it could be skewed a little bit um, because a lot of the locations that we've gone to, we've identified that their scales are not used in a commercial manner. They're used for just in-house packaging, things like that. So some of that data includes that, but there's a lot of scale tests that have happened in there. And with those precision scales, a couple of things need to happen. One, our weight kits are going to have to acclimate. If the investigator's doing their job right, that weight kit has to sit in your facility for 30 minutes and just sit there and acclimate. They're really, 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 really sensitive. We have to wear special gloves. You can't get finger oils on them and stuff like that. So once they acclimate, then we can proceed to do our tests. And the test typically for those scales doesn't take very long, you know, maybe 10 minutes at most. Um, we're just adding weights and then removing them. But, um, but yeah, so depending on the number of scales you have, um, after that acclimation occurs, we introduce ourselves uh, you know, down on 10 to 20 minutes per scale after that. Um, scales, if we find a scale that has an issue, depending on what it is, um, will issue potentially one of three enforcement tags. So the lowest enforcement tag we have is a yellow tag. It's a warning tag. That means it's a technical violation that needs to be corrected within a certain time frame. The only violation that we don't require you to fix there is if the scale is in the consumer's favor. So it's detrimental to you. That's where we go, hey, you're probably losing money on the scale. We definitely recommend that you get it calibrated, but we don't require it to be calibrated. We used to require that to be done within 30 days. Typically what we found out is because the business is, you know, losing money, they're gonna wanna get it calibrated. And so we didn't need to require that to happen anymore. And if they choose not to, well, it's not, you know, harming the consumer at all and it's their own business decision. So that's the way we've handled those. If it's the opposite where the consumer is not getting what they're paying for, it's out of tolerance in that direction. It's an out of service tag, a red tag. Red tag means that you need to have a service technician come in, a, a registered service representative come in and correct the issue on that scale. Uh, and, you know, typically it's for being out of calibration. Uh, and so that happens um, at whatever time frame you want it to happen. You just can't take that scale off until the scale is repaired. And then the service technician needs to submit a placed in service report notifying our division that, hey, I corrected this issue. Um, and that's one you know, they submit that on behalf of your company. And that's one thing that we look for when we do tag reinspections. Did they submit it within seven days of making that repair? Um, there are other types of violations that could occur with the scale marking requirements. Um, you know, if your indicator is not legible, uh, if it's not level, it's not able to be made level. Um, depending on what it is, it'll either be a yellow tag or a red tag. Um, you know, if it's something that we we're not in the business of going out there and fixing your scale for you. Um, I wish we could, because a lot of times they're easy fixes, like your scale is missing a foot. You know, you need to get a foot and put it back in there or seals. That was one thing that we can do now. We'll seal a scale if it's missing a seal and um, we test that it's accurate. Uh, so that's what you'll see. The only instance we'll use a blue tag, which is the stop sale, stop use tag, is if you have a scale that's not NTEP approved, it's not legal for trade. So there's the National Type Evaluation Program. Um, it is administered by the National Conference on Weights and Measures. It is an evaluation criteria for commercial devices to ensure that in all normal operating conditions, they'll continue to be accurate. Um, what we've found typically at, at dispensaries is that they have the right types of scales. Um, you seem to be very well educated in your industry on knowing what types of scales you need to have. Um, the issue where we find these little, you know, kind of scales you get off of Amazon or something, jewelry, pawn shops, 
that's uh, typically where we find things that aren't legal for trade. Uh, and we have confiscated those before if we're not confident that the location's gonna you know, stop using them. We have the authority to confiscate a device um, and after 180 days you can get it back or we will uh, dispose of it, which is always interesting. Um, but I've confiscated devices for, before in my past, you know, these little tiny scales for gems and things like that, um, but we don't do it that often. So blue tag is, is when that could happen. And you can't remove the blue tag from that device without our permission. Um, so if it's not NTIP approved means that scale's done. You can't use it commercially. But, um, you know, if you get a new scale in, obviously you can work with us to say, hey, is this the right type of scale that I need to get? We've had a lot of new businesses opening lately in different industries, and they've reached out to us proactively and said, hey, I'm opening this business. What do I need to do? This is the scale that I have. And we like that because people come to us ahead of time before we have to go out there and then tell them, hey, that scale you bought, you can't use that. And people are like, I spent $300 on this thing, you know, sorry, you know. So we love to provide that education ahead of time. We're happy to do that. If you need us to come out to a location and say, hey, you know, I'm putting my scale on this counter. Is this an okay place to do it? Because especially with the precision scales, you have it under an air vent. You have it on a floor surface that's not stable. You walk past that scale, it's going to fluctuate. And when you're using that scale for a transaction, that can make the difference between a consumer losing money or getting a fair transaction or your business losing money. Um, you know, we went to a location uh, one time where the air conditioner was blowing directly on the scale. And as soon as it turned off, scale was sitting at zero. As soon as it turned on, the scale was doing dancing around, as we call it. So, um, yeah, we're happy to, to provide that education if needed. And that goes with any business, any industry that we regulate, if you just want to have an educational visit where we walk you through what our inspections are like, we're happy to do that. We'd rather not have the surprises. Yeah, give us a call. And I just said Vince is pretty open to coming by any location and helping you guys. So yeah, yeah. Please take us up on that offer because we'd rather have that, and you know what to expect when we come there versus having surprises and you know it possibly resulting in civil penalties or things like that 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 you don't want. Um, the other thing that we've thought about doing, this is just, I'm going on on a little tangent here, is developing materials that are kind of a what to expect during an inspection. And we have a small scale brochure that kind of goes over that, so small capacity scales, but you know, going through, maybe putting something on our website that says, hey, this is what to expect during the inspection, because we've had challenges lately, especially at uh, fuel stations with people not being able to authorize the dispensers for us or not being responsive. And that can make the difference between a four hour inspection and an eight hour inspection. Uh, and so it's like, you know, we don't come to your location that often. We would really appreciate, you know, if, if you're proactive with us. And um, so we've thought about developing those materials and that may be a goal um, over the next year to, to work on. So lengthy answer to your question, but hopefully that answers everything there. Uh, no, so I'll get to that here. So those inspections take longer typically. So average 6.1 hours. Um, the reason right now is because there still aren't specifically established requirements for packaged cannabis. And we're going off of requirements for other containers labeled by weight or volume or things like that. And so it's a bit of a learning curve for us, as I'm sure it is, you know, for the cannabis industry on what the expectations are. Labeling has been an issue. You know, some of these containers are quite small and they can't fit all the information that they need to. You know, there's requirements, I think from the health department to have certain labeling. There's requirements for us that you need to have weight statements or whatever. And to be able to fit that on a nice looking package uh, can be really challenging. So some of the packaging materials um, we've noticed, you know, um, uh, allow moisture loss, you know, things like that, that you maybe don't want to happen because it can change the weight from the time it's packed to the time it's actually sold when we're testing it. And it's like, hey, why is this all of a sudden lighter than it used to be? Well, you have a wooden lid on that package that's allowing moisture to seep through. And so that's one of the questions at the national level. Do you apply a moisture loss percentage to these packages? So, um, so typically, whoops, typically, um, 
packaging inspections in any category are going to take longer because first we have to test our scale too. We have to make sure that, you know, if we're just doing an audit, you know, we're going through, we're estimating tear, we have to hit a certain number of items. If we're testing an item, then we at least need to have probably 12 that we're looking at and we need to first get the tear values to match. That's an issue we've had with cannabis products because the tear containers that are being used, the packaging, they've been very inconsistent. And so sometimes you have to then take apart 12 packages, get the tear values for all 12 and create an average, which is very time consuming. If you have packages, you know, typically in grocery, it's really easy to get the tears to match because you, you take two items, you know, using a box of cereal, for example, you clean it out, um, you weigh the box in the bag and you weigh the other box in the bag, they match great. I can apply that tear to everything else in the lot. But if you don't get the tears to match, our inspection is going to take longer. And so you may see our, our investigator kind of roll their eyes going, oh boy, I have to open things up. And the other thing I would say is be ready to, if you can, you know, a lot of times if we have to open packages, and I don't know in cannabis if we can do this, but if you have to open packages, have a way to repack that, you know, whatever item. Like if we go to the meat department, for instance, you can take that meat out and put it in another package and resell it. But I don't think you can do that probably. Yeah. And so that's kind of an issue because of the value of some of these items, you know, and the potential waste that happens, we're very conscious of that. So we try to eliminate that if we can, but it may get to a point where during an inspection, sorry, we have to open 12, you know, and yeah, it, it can be. And so it, yeah, that is, that's it, yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, that's why it's so important. And so what we've, yeah, yeah, well, it was a, a, absolutely. And so that's why it's very important, the companies that the companies that manufacture your packaging to make sure that you get a consistent product from them. Because like we had an instance where it was the vape cartridges, where every vape cartridge had a different tear weight. And so it made it look like the packages were short, but it was really the tear value of each cartridge that was the issue. And so you want to make sure that whoever you're getting your packaging from, they're getting you a consistent package. And I would take, if they ship you a fresh batch of containers, start putting them on the scale and see if they are the same weight. Or, you know, group like ones together so that if they're in the same lot, because that can create a big problem for us. We want to have those two. That's all we have to take for tear. But if we have to take 12 or whatever size the lot is, it's, it's not good for you. It's not good for us. And, um, I don't know if there's a solution trying to be worked out there at the national level with regard to terror, but there's a handbook, handbook 133 from NIST that tells you exactly how many you need to take for terror, depending on the type of package and things. And it can get pretty extensive. So we try to prevent that whenever we can, because we understand it can be a loss. So, um, so 6.1 hours, um, typically they'll take longer as you can see. Uh, and that's in, any category, but particularly cannabis right now because we're still figuring a lot of things out. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, all right, anything else? Uh, any other questions? Okay. No, and I don't think there's any need for an executive session. I don't think anything's come up during uh, this. Um, as I think we've done in the, in the past, Looking at the next meeting will be sometime within the next quarter. Uh, Kevin has done a great job of going ahead and just alerting the team of saying, hey, give us some options. I think that's the way that we'll proceed if there's no objections to that. Okay. And I think well, we don't have to call to adjourn the meeting anymore. So That's correct. Yeah, we don't, don't need to have a consensus to adjourn. That, so... All right, one more call just to see. Thank you very much for your uh, attendance today. It's nice to see a couple other faces in the room. Thank and you, hopefully uh, you're able to go back and join us again. All right. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks Thank to you. everyone out there, yes. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mark. Bye-bye.